Hello friends, welcome to King's Crux and today we will have yet another discussion on a case and we will derive one pearl as a part of this series of lectures called One Case, One Pearl. So we'll start things off with a 40 year old female who is presenting to our ophthalmology OPD with complaints of a painless progressive defective vision on her left eye for past six months. It is not an acute onset, but it's a rather a painless, a long-standing defective vision she is having. Now, she does not have any other relevant systemic illnesses. She is not a hypertensive, she is not a cardiac patient, she is not a diabetic. Uh, on examination, her visual acuity on the right eye is perfectly fine, 6-6, six, six, but on the left eye, the visual acuity is 6 by 60. Okay. On examination of her anterior segment, her right eye is totally fine. Left eye, everything is fine except for one crucial finding that is she had a relative afferent pupillary defect. What is that? Which means that on throwing the light on the left eye instead of constriction of pupil there is a dilatation of pupil. Okay, Just look at this picture. Now I am throwing light on the right eye. What happens if I throw the light on the right eye? The right eye pupil is constricting as well as the left eye pupil. But if I'm going to throw the light on the left eye, the left eye pupil is dilating. And not just that, even the right eye pupil is also dilated. So there is an afferent pupillary defect. Very important finding in our patient. So, so far, the patient is having a left eye RATD, which indicates the patient's optic nerve is not functioning well. There is some problem with the optic nerve of our patient. Now, this is the most important point. Whenever we see a patient with RAPD, even before we dilate the patient to look for fundus, I'm ordering two important investigations. One is a color vision, second is a field assessment. The color vision of this patient, the right eye is fine, but the left eye is defective. She was not able to read all the plates well. And looking at the field of this patient, have a look at this. The left eye shows a central scotoma, a central scotoma. Whereas right eye field is very much normal. Okay, now coming to the fundus. What is the most important thing you find in this fundus picture? The right eye fundus is totally fine. The right eye disc is normal. But just look at the left eye disc. The optic disc of this patient is elevated. The margins are blurred. There are few hemorrhages here and there indicating of an optic disc edema. So the patient is going to have a left eye optic disc edema. The right eye is fine. So let the juices keep flowing. What are the differentials for a patient with a left eye optic disc edema or a unilateral optic disc edema? Now this patient does not have a papilledema. Papilledema is almost always bilateral and it occurs because of a rise in intracranial tension. She will have, she may have a headache. Uh, she usually will not have an RAPD when there is a papal edema. Okay, that is an important thing to consider. So this patient's optic nerve is not functioning well because there is an edema on her left eye. But what caused this disc edema? The most important three differentials are number one, an optic neuritis. To be more precise, a papillitis. Optic neuritis has three variants. You have papillitis, which has an optic disc edema. Second is a retrobulbar neuritis where the disc may be normal. The third is a neuroretinitis. So there is a different discussion altogether, but just know that the patient, the first differential is a papillitis. The second differential is a NAAION, non-arthritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. The third differential is a compressive optic neuropathy. There are multiple reasons, but in our patient, considering her age, considering her symptoms, the three probable differentials. Now, I'm ruling out papillitis because papillitis presents with a sudden onset, painful, defective vision. But our patient has a long-standing, painless, progressive, defective vision. Second is NAAION. Our patient does not have any relevant systemic illnesses which could contribute to an ischemic event of the optic nerve. And more importantly, in NAAION, the fields will have an altitudinal field defect. One part 
of the pain will be abnormal. Plus the disc edema will be a pallid disc edema. P-A-L-L-I-D. Pallid disc edema means there is an edema, there is an associated sectoral or a temporal pallor of the disc. So we have ruled out the first two things. There is no papillitis, there is no NAAI oil from so far from the examination perspective. The third is a compressive optic lesion. A compressive optic neuropathy could be a probable diagnosis in our patient. So what I do, I order a neuroimaging. So I order an MRI brain with contrast specifically. Why? Just look at this. This is the MRI picture of our patient. Now, just look at this picture very carefully. I have written two important signs, a tram track sign and a donut sign. Now, what is that? Now, as you can see in the first picture where I have taken axial scan of the MRI brain, you can see the MRI orbit also. This green arrow indicates or points towards a white area or a white streak. Now, that is the optic nerve sheath. The yellow arrow points towards the optic nerve which is not white, which is not enhanced by the contrast. But the optic nerve sheet is enhanced by the contrast. Coming to the next picture, where I have mentioned as a donut sign, look at that. Again, the green arrow points towards the circle of white ring, which is the enhanced optic nerve sheet. The central black dot is the unenhanced optic nerve itself. Okay? Now, I'll make the picture more clearer for you. Now just look at this picture again. This is the patient, any patient who has optic nerve sheath meningioma. When a patient is going to have an optic nerve sheath meningioma, which is a tumor arising from an optic nerve sheath. So what happens? This is going to be my optic nerve. Consider the skin is going to be the optic nerve sheath or the meninges. So there is going to be a tumor involving my optic nerve sheath. Correct? Now what happens? The tumor is going to take up the contrast called gadolinium that is going to enhance, that is going to take up the dye that becomes a hyper intense lesion. Whereas the optic nerve is uninvolved, that remains normal or iso intense. So you have this so called tram track sign where on axial scans the optic nerve remains normal whereas the optic nerve sheath gets enhanced like a track the tram track sign on a coronal section on a coronal section it's going to appear like a target it's going to appear like a donut that is called as a donut sign so look at this picture again you can see that there is a tram track sign where there is a cuff of enhanced optic nerve sheet surrounding unenhanced optic nerve on the axial scan same on the coronal scan on the axial scan we call it as a tram track sign on coronal scan we call it as a bull's eye or a donut sign I hope that's clear. So, based on the radiological finding, we have come to a diagnosis. The patient is having a left eye optic nerve sheath meningioma, which is a very common optic nerve tumor, especially in a middle-aged patient presenting with a monocular progressive painless vision loss with an optic disc edema. The first thing should come to your mind is a meningioma or some kind of a tumor compressing the optic nerve in the orbital compartment, right? Now let us discuss about it. Now what the patient is having now is going to be a compressive optic neuropathy. That is what the pathology in this patient is. Just look at this table again. Now there are two important types of lesions which can cause a compressive optic neuropathy. One is going to be a neoplastic, other is going to be a non-neoplastic. Amongst the neoplasts, as you can see in the box, optic nerve sheath meningioma is a very, very important cause. One of the most frequently found tumors in such patients. In non-neoplastic, it is thyroid disease is going to take a predominance on orbital pseudotumors will have such kind of a picture. But in our patient, the MRA clearly showed that it was a single eye getting involved, whereas in a thyroid it will be mostly bilateral. Uh, a single eye with a typical tram track sign, donut sign, points towards optic nerve sheath meningioma. So our patient is going to have a compressive optic lesion. Now that is the meningioma. Now let us look at the pathology for a moment. Now, as we all know, there are two important histopathological features in optic nerve sheath meningioma. One is 
presence of the proliferation of meningothelial cells. Now, this is a tumor which arises from the meningothelial cells of the arachnoid villi. The arachnoid is one of the is the middle layer of the meninges. You have dura, arachnoid, and pia. You have the arachnoid. The arachnoid villi has so-called arachnoid cap, CAP, cap cells. Now you have tumorous cells proliferating from that. So you have this lobules called meningothelial lobules, which are separated from the fibrovascular strands. That's the very first important histopathological feature. The second feature is called as the samoma bodies, which you might have heard in your entrance preparation classes. Uh, samoma bodies are nothing but they are circular, concentric, lamellated calcium bodies which are also frequently seen in meningiomas. Now look at this picture. Now I have clearly demarcated the meningothelial lobules separated from the other lobules by fibrovascular strands. The second picture shows the samoma bodies in this patient. Right? Now this is the histopathology. Let's come to the actual pathogenesis of this patient. Very, very important. Now this is our concern. Now, the optic nerve is traveling from the eye to the brain. So anything is going to compress the optic nerve that is going to cause the so-called compressive optic neuropathy. So the flow or the axoplasmic flow is affected in this patient. That is one important thing. There's an optic nerve dysfunction, the first pathology. Second, as the tumor grows, okay, the most uh, common area of this tumor is going to be the intraorbital part of the optic nerve. The optic nerve, as it travels through the orbital compartment, that is going to get involved more. So there's going to be a rise in the orbital pressure. So increased intraorbital pressure. The second reason why the symptoms arise. So two things, compression of optic nerve, increase in intraorbital pressure. Now what happens when the optic nerve compresses? Now the optic nerve is going to get compressed. Okay. What happens as common sense dictates, there is going to be a defective vision. The vision is getting affected. But it's not just with the vision. There is a defective vision, defective field of vision, defective color vision. Now when I'm going to see this patient, I'm going to find a relative afferent pupillary defect which indicates an optic nerve dysfunction. Okay, so far clear? The common symptoms what a patient could have because of an optic nerve compression. How will it manifest in the patient as in the fundus? So there are two important disc findings two important vascular changes happening. The two important disc findings are number one is the disc edema. The second is a disc atrophy. The disc edema comes first, later on progressing towards an optic disc atrophy because the neurons die, the disc becomes pale, becomes atrophied. Now this is what we call as secondary optic atrophy where a lesion causing an edema first leading on to an atrophy later is what you call it as a secondary optic atrophy. But textbook says that compressive lesions, compressive optic nerve lesions usually directly go on to optic atrophy without an optic disc swelling. That's a classic description given in textbooks. What you call as a primary optic atrophy. So compressive lesions, retrobulbar neuritis, toxic optic neuropathies, they usually will cause optic atrophy without a previous optic disc swelling. But here is the important caveat, very important clinical nugget. Meningiomas usually present with optic disc edemas first because they are in the orbit, they are in the intraorbital lesion. There is a stasis of axoplasmic flow as the result of this. They might be an edema uh, because of the venous congestion happening there. There is an edema of the optic disc. And that will progress to an optic atrophy is what we call as the secondary optic atrophy. Okay. Now that is the two important, uh, those are the two important disc findings what you can expect in optic nerve sheath meningiomas. What about the vascular changes? Now, I just told this to remind you again, the optic nerve sheath meningiomas can also present with a simple temporal pallor. Just look at this patient. Okay, just look at this optic disc. You can assess a temporal paler. That is a neuroretinal rim of the temporal part of optic disc is a bit pale. Okay.
okay on taking a neuro imaging you can see that there is going to be a, a ct has been taken and, and it shows some kind of an enhancement some kind of a enlargement of the optic nerve sheath there which indicates a probable optic nerve sheath meningitis so never ever miss a temporal panel that is a thing now just look at this patient now this patient is our patient the patient who i discussed i have seen her after 6 months just look how the optic disc looks the optic disc looks very pale it is not of normal color and if pointed an arrow towards some important lesion that will be the very first vascular change that is the optico ciliary shunt what is this optico ciliary shunt now as the name implies there is a shunt or there is a collateral vessels which are formed as a result of a chronic venous compression there is a chronic venous compression that is going to be formation of shunts or collaterals in other words these are enlarged peripapillary vessels okay because of diversion of blood from the central retinal venous circulation to the choroidal circulation so you have two important circulation existing one is the central retinal venous circulation and choroidal circulation because of the compression of the venous circulation in the crv system there is going to be formation of shunts or enlargements of shunts forming these tortuous uh, looks like a new uh, new vessels but they are not okay these is tortuous vessels which are present over the disc called as optico ciliary shunts or collaterals very very important feature in optic nerve sheath meningiomas as you can see in this picture it has clearly shown in the first picture there is the opto ciliary shunt vessels which are present on the nasal surface of the disc and on taking a neuro imaging you can see the typical tram track growth even ct picks up this tram track growth in fact ct picks up the calcification better than mri as you might have read and you can see that uh, the optic nerve looks fine but you can see that very dense hyper intense lesion on the optic nerve so what are the differential diagnosis for opto ciliary shunt vessels as i just mentioned the most important cause is going to be an optic nerve sheath meningioma the second is going to be a glioma in crvo in glaucomas and even in chronic papilledemas we can expect this opto ciliary shunt vessels right now now let's look at the second vascular change the first is going to be an opto ciliary shunt the second as the tumor grows it is going to compress the blood vessels supplying the optic nerve what happens especially when the eyeball moves there's going to be a relative compression an eyeball moving towards say laterally at that moment there is maybe a compression there and that will cause a transient obscuration of vision a transient obscuration of vision when the patient is going to look at one particular gaze that is called as a gaze evoked amaurosis or a gaze evoked transient loss of vision which is another important feature seen in any compressive optic nerve lesions so we have two vascular changes opto ciliary shunt and transient ischemia of the optic nerve now what happens when the intraorbital pressure rises i i told that because of compressive optic neuropathy the problems are coming the second problem is because of a rise in intraorbital pressure now as the intraorbital pressure rises what happens like in this patient there is going to be proptosis the eyeball is going to bulge out that is called proptosis now look at this first picture the c as you can see that this patient tries to look up his uh, left eye is elevating but the right eye is not elevating the right eye has a restricted elevation movement now why this occurs because the tumor has engulfed the extraocular muscle probably superior rectus here so what happened there is a restrictive myopathy there is a restrictive myopathy of the of the right eye so thereby the patient also have a diplopia or a double vision as his primary complaint so to sum up very very important table the symptoms are chronic progressive painless defective vision diplopia or double vision a gaze evoked amaurosis or a transient obscuration of vision proptosis coming to the signs the patient will have a variable visual acuity a relative afferent pupillary defect dyschromatopsia or a defective color vision 
visual field defects, more commonly a central scotoma or a central cecal scotoma. The fundus will show an optic disc edema, an atrophy, optociliary shunts, and retinal folds. Now, a very important question they may ask in your exams is this classic triad called Hoyt Spencer triad. It's a triad with vision loss, optic atrophy, and optociliary shunt. Now, all these three things may not come at the same time, but these three things form the classic triad in an optic nerve sheet meningioma, that is a Hoyt Spencer triad. So what is the treatment aspect? Observe. As long as the vision is not affected, as long as there is no threatened neurological impairment, we can observe in these patients. Only when there's going to be a visual disturbance or a very uh, symptomatic patients or a threatening of neurological uh, aspect of the patient, then we go in for intervention. Two interventions are there, surgeries, risky because there is a risk of bleeding. Uh, the optic nerve as well as the sheath have a common blood supply, have a common pile, P-I-A-L, pile blood supply. So there is a risk of bleeding. Uh, but the third, uh, as you can see in this, stereotactic fraction radiotherapy is currently a very important, a very safe treatment option in these patients. So radiotherapy is currently accepted as a treatment of choice when you have to intervene in a patient. Now, before I end, I want to give a very important differentiating diagnosis amongst the compressive lesions. There are two important optic nerve lesions which can compress. I'll tell the differences now. That is, the, uh, those are the optic nerve sheet meningioma. Second is the optic nerve glioma. These optic nerve gliomas are not exactly a compressive lesion because they arise from the optic nerve glial cells. Now these glial cells are the supportive cells. So they kind of means they are from the optic nerve. So they are more of an infiltrative lesion rather than a compressive lesion like a meningiomas. But knowing the differences between them is very important because these are the two most common optic nerve tumors. So optic nerve sheath meningiomas are usually seen in middle-aged female, whereas a glioma are classically present in children. Optic nerve sheath meningiomas, as we just discussed, they arise from a meningothelial cells of the arachnoid villi, whereas gliomas arise from astrocytes, those are nothing but the glial cells. To be more precise, the pilocytic or hair-like astrocytes. Meningiomas, neurofibromatosis number two is the association, whereas gliomas are often seen in neurofibromatosis one. And if you find a patient with a bilateral gliomas, suspect neurofibromatosis 1. And I just discussed the shuns, the ciliary shuns are more common with meningiomas, but not so common in glioma when compared to meningiomas. And meningiomas are mostly compressive tumors, whereas gliomas are more of infiltrative. They can be compressive also. The second important differentiating comes with the radiology. Now, there is a tubular enlargement of optic nerve with the meningiomas, but a fusiform enlargement of the optic nerve in gliomas. So you have this typical classic tram track sign in meningiomas, whereas you have a pseudo CSF sign in glioma. Just know that why the pseudo CSF sign occurs because of infiltration of tumors in the arachnoid membranes. There's arachnoid gliomatosis. No cystic changes in case of meningiomas, but you may expect cystic changes in gliomas. Calcification, yes, seen in meningiomas, but kinking of optic nerve, not calcification, but you can see kinking or bending, tortuosity of the optic nerve in gliomas. So to put it in a, a easy way to understand, the meningiomas are mostly a tubular growth because it's going to be the meninges, the skin here, like for example, is going to get involved. The gliomas are going to involve the optic nerve. It's so, that, so there's a fusiform enlargement of the of the optic nerve. So knowing these two differences is very, very important. Now I want to end with our usual messages. Message number one, whenever you look, whenever you see an RAPD, <clears throat> it indicates an optic nerve dysfunction. Most commonly, it's optic nerve dysfunction. Remember that. Message number two, when you see an RAPD, always look for optic nerve head or optic disc. They can be either be edematous or pallor or even normal. RAPD, the disc may be even normal. So whenever you have an optic nerve edema, 
failure or even normal status. Always, always do these two important investigations. Visual fields, color vision. Contrast sensitivity if required. That's the third thing. But more commonly, visual fields, color vision. If abnormal, if they're abnormal, if you're going to find a color vision defect or if you're going to find a field uh, defects, reassess, go back, ask relevant history. Just think about it. What's happening in this patient? Why this patient is going to have this problem? Why the patient is having color vision deficiency or a field defect? There could be a compression of the optic nerve, which you may miss. So always, always order neuroimaging. Relevant, accurate neuroimaging if required. So I'm going to leave with one pearl. What is the pearl in our patient? The pearl is, if you're going to miss an RAPD, you will miss the patient's life. You will lose the patient's life. So that is the pearl I want to give you in this lecture because all it takes is a torchlight, no fancy equipments, no fancy imaging features, no slit lamps also. This requires a torchlight to save the patient's life. So thank you so much for your interest in this uh, lecture. I had a very good feedback from the for the previous lectures as well. So that just, let me just continue with this. So happy reading, cheers, take care, be safe.